let me not parameterize it by this. Let me parameterize it by tau. So I think the expression we ended up with was something like this. Okay, and we interpreted that very phase as a measure of a solid angle enclosed by the, the surface. So your path integral, again, is, is sort of the lo locus of points. That omega, the unit vector, takes <clears throat> um, as it traverses around this sphere in, in time or imaginary time. And that path has to be closed, remember? So let's see, something like, that's your unit vector. It's moving as a function of imaginary time as you sort of go through the, you know, extra dimension of the path integral from zero to beta. So if I call this solid angle omega, then the topological part of, of the action, which I'm calling the Berry phase as topo, is IS omega. <clears throat> um, and last time we finished the class by arguing for the, the quantization of S because of the ambiguity of defining omega on this two sphere. Right? Let me just run through that quickly, just to uh, review. And then I'm going to show how this is related to a vector potential. So the basic argument is that when, when the action is exponentiated, that's the object that controls the physics of the path integral. So it should be somehow invariant. You can imagine setting the Hamiltonian to zero. Just for sake of argument. <clears throat> then we have to reconcile this fact with the idea that I could have defined my coordinate system such that Instead of defining omega with the orange solid angle, I could define an omega prime with the purple. One for a coordinate system defined with z like this. One for a coordinate system defined with z and minus z flipped. All right. So then the the part of the action that matters. Oh, I did want to write it like this. This is how I wrote it last time. So I just parameterized. Since that path is closed uh, and there's no velocity in the Berry phase, right? You can just write it as a closed path, a closed integral like that. Or if we you reverse the definitions of this axis. 
So it'll be, let's see, cos pi minus theta. Which gives you minus i s omega prime. <clears throat> okay, so the equation we ended up with last time. It's something like that. Right, which is just a statement of this condition that, you know, the, the physics isn't, isn't changed by the definition of this coordinate system. But then that leaves us with e to the i s omega plus omega prime has to equal unity. And because we're on a sphere, We're constrained. We're constrained by the topology of that sphere such that omega plus omega prime is just the surface area of that sphere, the solid angle. So this implies S has to be zero or half integer. <clears throat> okay, so that's how the quantization dropped out I'm just considering the Berry phase. Okay, so there's a couple other steps I guess you have to go through to convince yourself of this, like the equivalent of, of this form parameterized by uh, phi and that form parameterized by tau. <clears throat> but in the end, it boils down to just the geometric, the global geometric constraint on the path integral that gives you this uh, spin quantization. So in this case, it comes from a purely geometrical instead of an algebraic sort of reasoning. So we're just seeing it from some algebraic, you know, theory of angular momentum, spin raising, spin lowering operators, and so on. Okay, so that's what we did last time. That's, I think, one important lesson that you learn from the path integral in this class. So let me go on and write this action in a slightly different way now. Okay, so I want, so that tau derivative one minus cos theta. When I write a dot, I'm just writing the tau derivative. And let me write this in terms of the velocity of that unit vector as it moves around um, the two sphere in the path integral. So let's remember what the definition of omega is. It's actually r hat if you write it. Remember when I wrote it all out? <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a unit vector of the radial direction. But I was calling it omega vector. But just remember, it's, it's a part of this set of, of spherical polar unit vectors.
So its velocity <clears throat> should be something like, right, the radial direction, you know, there's a constraint on the, on the, unit, the unit vector, so you can write this in terms of thetas and phis. And you just have to keep these scale factors in mind. Okay, so if I compare this to, to the action here, I can, put, I can put that omega dot in the action by defining a vector potential. And there's more than one choice for this vector potential. There's a gauge invariance associated with these things, of course. But let me choose this one here. <clears throat> okay, so now my action has the velocity of the unit vector dot, this A vector. It should give me back something like this if you work it out. And just by the simple definition of this vector potential, the interpretation of, of the, the Berry phase um, becomes different than even what we're looking at here. So let's look at this interpretation. So, So now this action looks like the action of a particle moving in a uh, vector potential. It has some charge. I guess the charge is S. So quote unquote charge. And how the vector potential affects the charge, of course, or affects the motion, is that it's a source of a, of a magnetic field we can call B. Which is defined as the curl. Um, And if you take that curl and you do it properly in spherical polar coordinates, then you'll see that just this just turns into uh, the unit vector back again. So the magnetic, so it's like a, the action of a particle, you know, moving in a classical magnetic field, but the field is at the origin of the sphere, and it's of unit magnitude in this sense, constant unit strength pointing radially outward. Is that a magnetic monopole then? Right, yeah. So it's just a monopole field, right?
So right, you can see that as a magnetic monopole. And I think, yeah, you can see that if you just wrote the divergence of B as using Maxwell equation, 4 pi, the charge of that monopole, right? So that the monopole would have strength, you know, 4 pi with charge 1. Okay, so just another equivalent way of, of looking at that action. So particle moves in a radial magnetic monopole of constant strength. It's also centered at the origin of the sphere. Which is important. Because now you imagine that you have your sphere, you have your magnetic monopole with charge <clears throat> 4 pi, or rho is 1. Your action is describing a path somewhere around that sphere. But if you look at your vector potential, there's also a singularity in that vector potential. So by this coordinate axis, this is my z-axis here, <clears throat> that singularity occur occurs when, when theta is, what, pi? So when, when that denominator explodes. And so what you're talking about is, is a singularity on the minus z-axis. <clears throat> Does anyone know the interpretation of that singularity? in the monopole language. Monopoles, you know, the way you create a monopole is you create, a, you take a dipole and you break it up and you remove half of it to infinity. And the, the two ends of the dipole are connected by a Dirac string. So that's the Dirac string coming out the bottom there. That's like the invisible string that connects you know, <laughs> two parts of a monopole or two parts of a dipole. Sounds like magic. What you... <laughs> I mean, what it does is it just gives you, in E and M, it gives you singularities like that in, in vector potentials. So it's just it's a it's a singularity that occurs in something that's sort of gauge, that's that's a you know, that's kind of like a gauge dependent quantity. So it's not it's not physical in what we you know it's it's not physical in, in in the action or something like that. The you know if we have a very small so I take this yellow curve and I put it so such that it's just infinitesimal infinitesimally not touching that singularity. I can still continuously deform that yellow line through the Dirac string without affecting the action. Okay, so this only gives you, I guess, intuition if you're used to seeing this in, in E and M. But it's just, it's just something that occurs for us in, in this action interpretation. So we have a monopole at the center. You know, the particle feels the charge, the magnetic charge of that monopole. The monopole is created by taking a dipole and moving one of the charges to infinity. And that drag string is how you can imagine that happening. And the sort of ambiguity in defining that path uh, defines, you know, the, the ambiguity in the Berry phase in the same way as the definition of the, uh, of the z-axis, right? So you can either pull that Dirac string 
down through the south pole, or you could redefine that vector potential so that the direct string goes up through the uh, through the north pole or at the top of this surface somewhere. And the only thing that'll change in the action is that global, you know, geometric you know, sort of definition here. So just another way of it's just another formalism by which you can see the same thing. So that's omega is minus z. So, you'll hear people talk about geometrical phases and monopoles and field theories in the same breath, pretty much, because, because this intuition of just redefining your action to have this, this, uh, this vector potential reformulates the problem in, in an E&M type language, um, which is more comfortable for some people, I guess. Not me, maybe, but... <clears throat> And so in this E&M language, um, a lot of the phenomena of sort of modern condensed matter physics it is tied uh, to, to, to monopoles or to various phases. <clears throat> and this derivation that we did for the single particle spin path integral is really just the simplest manifestation of the Berry phase. So there's many different uh, phenomena that have monopole physics or topological physics that you basically see all the time in condensed matter. This one gives you, so this sort of simple Berry phase, which occurs because of the topology of the two-sphere in the path integral, pretty straightforwardly gives you um, a, the different dispersion of, of ferromagnetic versus anti-ferromagnetic um, Heisenberg models, which is something that could be derived in, in other ways. I guess if I had my act together, I would drive that in this class, but I'll just tell you the result. I'll just say this term effects. So it affects the dispersion of ferromagnets versus anti-ferromagnets. Um, it, cause, it causes the Haldane gap. So it's one way of seeing a Haldane gap in integer versus non-integer spins. So if you have spin change, which chains, which are, which are spin one half versus spin one, there's a gap that occurs for in the integer case, which is due to the Berry phase.
So these are sort of two historical cases where the berry phase is important. But in these cases, I would say these effects, like the different dispersion of these different interacting models and this gap were known by other means. This one's called Haldane's gap because it was conjectured early on by Haldane. It's actually proven numerically by DMRG. It's one of the first uh, sort of success stories of the di density matrix renormalization group by Steve White was, was predicting this gap or numerically measuring this gap that was predicted by, by Haldane. So these topological terms become more complicated when you move away from the two sphere, so more complicated path integrals of different topological terms. stupid names, like theta terms. We Zemino Witten terms. I don't know. Turn Simons terms. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Turn Simons terms, which are important in the fractional quantum hall. Uh, state. You know who Simons is? He's this hedge fund. He runs this big hedge fund. I think it's called Renaissance Technologies. It's like makes consistently something like a 34% like profit. Even through like 2008, he was like one of the big hedge funds that just, I don't know what they did. They short sold on a whole bunch of stuff, made tons of money. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the guys, he's like one of the original quants. He's an old guy now. Um, yeah, they do all this high frequency stuff. They have this like one of these pricing models that's sort of like top secret. They've been using for decades, and it it's just crazy. So has, this is the guy that that runs the Simon's Foundation, uh, and they fund a lot of physics now. Um, he's worth some, you know, he's worth billions of dollars. So before he did that, he invented the turn. One of the inventors of this turn Simon's topological uh, term that that affects the physics of the uh, fractional quantum Hall effect. These are all different, so, but, but they affect, you know, they give you the integer, the anomalous, quantum Hall effects. Fractional quantum Hall. This is what Bob Laughlin got the Nobel Prize for, was explaining this fractional quantum Hall. While semi-metals, that's another one. While you get a metals that instead of having a Fermi surface, <clears throat> they basically occur at the node of a Dirac, like a Dirac point. And you can have a topological term that's you know similar to the Berry's phase. It comes out of the same types of type of physics. Um, in the path integral. And it gives you a metal that has some topological property. This is what Anton Burkov works on, almost exclusively. It's pretty cool stuff. So, I don't know. All of these, all of these, I guess, words I'm putting on the board, hopefully some of them are familiar to you, but I think they're worth looking at in more detail because a lot of the modern uh, field of condensed matter is working on these types of topological terms. So the Berry phase is the simplest sort of case of a, of a whole uh, rich subfield of physics. And it's just a different sort of philosophy of looking at the path integral. So everything we're learning in this class is kind of like the local structure of the path integral, except the Berry phase, you know, which has something to do with the topological structure. So that's just the philosophical difference.
Just like this. There's a global geometry here. Yeah, but that's the geometry of the spin group. In this yeah. But what about if I, for instance, have the Isaac model on a sorry for the subset? Could that topology also be? That topology doesn't give you necessarily this type of berry phase. Mm -hmm. That's not what I mean, yeah. So if I have a so if I have a if I have an Ising model on a torus, the path integral description of that thing is typically in the continuum, and the boundary conditions don't matter. I mean, they matter in some detail, um, but it's not it's not the same physics that gives you this. Right? For instance, in the fractional quantum model, the, the case where if you change from a sphere to a torus, you have different phases. Right? Yeah, that's true. Um, so in that case, it does affect it, but I think in the Ising model, it doesn't. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. like model dependent. I think so. I think it's dependent on the form of the path integral. So, I mean, it's, it's almost, I guess we've seen this before, you know, the, when, the, when the Grossman path integral is affected by the global topology of, of the partition function, that affects your physics too. So I shouldn't say, it's not just, you know, local quantities. These global quantities can affect it, but this is a different type of global quantity. So, so not, I'll just say not local structure. Yeah, so you have to be a bit careful. You're right. So that's basically all I'm going to say about, specifically about this global structure of the Berry phase. <clears throat> I just want to do one more thing with the spin path integral, and that's derive the classical equations of motion. And we could have done this for any of the path integral derivations that we did, but I don't know, I think it's more interesting for the the spin case. <clears throat> okay, so we have a path integral has a has a topological and a Hamiltonian term in it. And you know, I've just been writing the action a lot, but we have a full partition function that's the you know, it's the uh, functional integral over that exponentiated action. That's that's the full quantum mechanics of the system. But we can we can we can find the extrema of that action to just find the classical equations of motion, right? So this, even though this is starting to look pretty bizarre, we should be able to back out the classical equations of motion uh, from the two terms of the the spin path integral action. So this is like the sanity check that I want to do now. Since, since we've gone pretty far into la-la land here. So let's derive the <clears throat> classical equations of motion. So let's work with the Hamiltonian form. But you could also write some path integrals in the Lagrangian form. And the difference in the Hamiltonian Lagrangian form in the single particle path integral was somehow we were successful in performing a Gaussian integral over, over exactly the Berry phase, right? So it's kind of taking the Berry phase and, and just making it classical. So, the extremal path configurations, like what I said at the start of the class, Give the classical equations of motion. And, you know, since, 
since extremizing, is that a word? The action involves taking the first derivative. We have to take the first derivative of a functional, which is just a function of functions. Okay, so in, in this case, in the spin case, it's pretty nice. It just all boils down to taking partial derivatives. But philosophically, you have to remember that these are functionals and then adjust your, I guess, thinkings in, to account for that. But for us, it's fairly simple, but just let me make a note of that, so. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Like that statement makes sense because it's classical image sending h bar to zero, right? Yeah. But in here in the path integral first thing, we don't have that thing. Are there factors of h bar weighting the action? Uh, where's our factors of h bar here? It's so in this case, the equivalent is taking s to infinity. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's the equivalent of taking h bar to zero. Yeah. So I can show you after, I think if you take s to infinity, then the overlap becomes exponentially suppressed or something like that. Yeah, so that's the equivalent. But so we just need to find somehow the first derivative. So it's usually written as a variation. So my action has parameters like x and p or theta and phi. I'm always writing for these, these, you know, these spin cases. So really what you do is you, you just want to do some finite difference on the action where you vary the parameters such that you know, this, I don't know, they use delta, right, for these, these, uh, these variations. And this becomes equivalent to the finite difference sort of first uh, derivative when this goes to zero. <clears throat> so formally, it's a finite difference. In our case, we basically just have to take derivatives of the action um, for all the parameters Q that occur in it. So partial derivatives with respect to uh, theta and phi. Okay, so let's uh, write our partition function. Remember what we're doing here. Oops, got the G. Okay, so the quantum mechanics involves the entire functional integral. But what we're doing to get the classical equations of motion is just taking this thing here, which is the action, and basically taking its derivative, its first derivative, with respect to the parameters. And we have two terms. And let me consider a Hamiltonian that's just the simplest s dot b. Yeah, cool. So then my action has two pieces. Um, so s topo, I've written 100 times. But if my Hamiltonian is just
the dot product of the spin in some global magnetic field. That's the simplest way to write a Hamiltonian. Then, let me see, then this term here, I've written before, I think. Just gives me S, the magnitude of the spin, and the time integral of B dot, the unit vector. Right, which is B cos theta, if you will. <clears throat> okay, so when I want to take this first derivative on the action, you can essentially just take it on Take the derivative on the Lagrangian, which occurs inside the action, if you think back to the single particle case. We can just define the Lagrangian in the same way here. There I would have something like R, uh, what, R derivative and momentum. And I the T's are the, the time evolution of the path. So now I have an action. It has a time evolution in imaginary time. And a Lagrangian is just these pieces without the, the tau integral, right? I just pull it out front. So I'll define, let's see, Lagrangian in two parts, Doppel plus B. Uh, which is so dumb. So this is not the Berry's phase, but it's too late now. It's the B of the Hamiltonian. Um, okay, and I'll do the time derivative of phi there. Let's see, plus S. Uh, B dot omega. <clears throat> okay, so just two pieces. I can handle each one separately. And basically what I want to do is take the, I want to vary the Lagrangian, or vary the action, with respect to these two parameters, theta and um, phi, and set that to zero, okay? So it's the first derivative you set it to zero, you're finding the, the extrema of the action. That should give you the classical equations of motion. They have to be buried in this thing somehow. <clears throat> okay, so we're basically ignoring all the quantum mechanics now. So this, this, this is like neither quantum nor many body, so I don't know why it's in this class. But I don't know, I like it. Okay, so let's, let's start with the Hamiltonian piece first. Okay. Let me just write down what the unit vector is so that I remember it. So it's cos, 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 oh shit, sine, uh, phi, um, cos, theta. Ah. Yeah, sine, cos, man, this is so wrong. Like after I've taken a derivative or something. This is, should be a sign. 
Oh, and this one should probably be assigned too. Yeah, yeah. Does that look right? I'm trying to underive it. Okay, sine, cos, sine, sine, cos. Okay, that's it. That's what we need to do. Man, if you get that wrong, you're screwed. Okay. Okay, so let's, right, so the only thing that matters really is that unit vector because we're assuming B is constant in magnitude. So we need the, der the partial derivative of that thing with respect to theta. This is what I was trying to undo. So this one's cos, cos, this one's cos, sine. And then it's theta, so it's minus sine. <clears throat> okay, good. Okay, so maybe it's not obvious by looking at it. But if you Google it like I did, you see that it's just theta hat. It's just the unit vector in. That's how all these things work, right? <clears throat> As, uh, you know, up to the scale factors, you take these derivatives, you get you get the uh, you get the unit vectors out. So it's actually the same thing for the phi derivative. So let's see, sine theta. I can pull a sign out front, and then it's minus sine phi cos phi zero. And so that's your like h or your scale factor, whatever it's called, times the unit vector in the other direction. Okay, so that's enough. We can uh, take the dot product with V, uh, with B, but let's get the topological piece first. Again, we have two partial derivatives for this topological term. <clears throat> So let me take the theta one first, because it's easy. So what am I calling this? L topo maybe? Theta. Good. Okay, so the theta one's easy. So to get the phi one, let's just use multiple applications of the chain rule until it makes sense. in terms of that thing. So how do I do that? So I have theta dot, which is the partial derivative of theta with respect to tau. Hmm. I want L top of L theta. So what I want is, oh, sorry, this is phi. So I want this in terms of theta, then I can use that expression. So then I have this 
theta. Hmm. Okay, this will work. So then I can I can insert del tau del phi. Oh yeah, okay, good. <clears throat> so that thing I know just from that chalkboard, I assign theta. Um, I got theta dot here. Oh, I forgot my phi dot. But my phi dot's divided by phi dot here. Oh man, chain rule's awesome. You just treat everything like fractions and it works. Good. So this is I S theta dot sign. Okay, there's probably an easier way to do that. <clears throat> okay, so that's all we need. Um, this will give us the variation of LB with the two parameters. And this and this gives us the variation of L topo with the two parameters. Okay, so what are those two equations? So one comes from the two terms varied with respect to theta. So let me collect all, all of this. So which one is theta? Okay, so. Uh-huh, sb dot omega. So that's one equation. And the same thing with respect to phi. Writing these in reverse order. I don't know why. They're additive. See, that's S phi dot B. Okay, I got signs in both of those terms, but I'm setting it equal to zero. Okay, so that's your classical equations of motion. So the trick is figuring out what the hell they mean. So let's just massage, I guess, these, these second terms a little bit that have these dot products in them. <clears throat> And for that, just remember how the unit vector looks. I want to write the time derivative. I have something like I'm varying the, the, the unit vector 
in, by some infinitesimal change, you know, it's, uh, if you take into account all the scale factors, then that time derivative in the theta direction, well, basically just like came out here, you'll just get a theta time derivative. And the time derivative in the phi direction, you have the scale factor time. <clears throat> okay, again, just derivatives in a spherical polar, polar coordinate system. So I can rewrite my set of equations. with dot products in both terms. Okay, so that's like my set of equations. Okay, so it's, it's kind of nice if I can get something dot phi, something dot phi, something dot theta, something dot theta. And I have these unit vectors. So that one I don't need, but let me think. I think this is the right order here. So my theta, my phi can be written as minus, it's gotta be minus omega cross theta and phi cross omega. So again, this is all just, I don't know what I'm doing now, teaching a class on math phys. It's just all um, curvilinear coordinate systems. But I just wanna substitute in for theta and for phi. Now I want to be able to pull the second term, manipulate the second term so that I have theta instead of phi here and, and uh, phi instead of theta here. <clears throat> but I see there's a minus sign problem, so. I can see that already because I have these written in The wrong order. I can see that because when I substitute these in, I'll get get that set. <clears throat> but I want to rewrite the cross product so that it's omega cross B. And I have these cross products and a dot, cross products and a dot. Should be able to use no B has to be cyclic like this, so A cross C. Well, okay. So I want to write omega cross B. But I don't know, I dropped the minus sign somewhere. <clears throat> I'm not chasing it now, man. That ship has sailed. 
So one of these will be right. They should both be right. So we can just look at the one that's right. So if I just manipulate these so that I can write omega cross b, what I should get is, I think from the first one, this will be right. You'll get minus sine omega cross b dot phi. That's what I wanted. It's like a dot phi and dot phi here. Yeah, but I think the second one, because I have to flip the order of the cross product. Should have a minus sign here, but I don't know where it went. So one of these, one of these, uh, probably one of these things is wrong. <clears throat> and, you know, I just worked them out like right before class. So. So see if you can track that down. <laughs> Otherwise, I have these both give me, you know, the, the set gives me one equation of motion, which is what I was looking for. And it has to be a minus sign because what I want for the classical equation of motion is, let's see, I, S. This thing, yeah, right? equals S and a cross product here. It's like the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion. Okay, that's just a bit of spherical polar nonsense, which is causing me some problems, but <clears throat> does that look familiar? I don't know why I wrote zero. <laughs> I had one minus the other equals zero, but I turned it into an equal sign, so. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, it's, it's this minus this equals zero. So the omegas are kind of like the weird thing in there. But you can compare it to the classical equations of motion that you're maybe used to. Well, one weird thing is this omega was just used to, I don't know, define the, the spin. <clears throat> when we had the coherent state. So I can imagine and I just have a spin expectation value. So, so if, my, if my spin was a classical vector, you know, it's just pointing in the direction of omega. But also, I did something weird a long time ago when I did a wick rotation. Because t went to minus i tau, right? So these time derivatives are actually tau derivatives or that time derivative is actually a tau derivative. So this imaginary number will, will drop out after you wick rotate back. Okay, so I use the, you know, I could have used a different path integral that wasn't <clears throat> in imaginary time, but. When I wick rotate back, I'll get something that you can compare to classical equation of motion that's just this like Gilbert equation or whatever they call it. Okay, so it's just magnetization dynamics. Which would be the time derivative of S, which is on the left hand side. and S cross B. They're basically equating definitions of torque. So it's sort of just the coherent state path integral 
analogy of, of this equation of motion here. <clears throat> Up to a minus sign, wherever that went. And it only, I don't know why it only affected one of those equations. So. Close enough for government work. So that's just, that took a while. But somehow the, the idea was, we just extremized the action, we threw away all the quantum mechanics, and even though the path integral looks weird, even though it's got a berry phase and everything in it, you know, you get the right classical equations of motion. And you know, the berry phase is, you know, it's in there, right? It's, it's, it gives you this part of the, this part of the uh, equation, so it's, it's quite important. So again, that was all somehow non-quantum mechanical single body physics. Um, you can do the many body sort of generalization of the single particle spin coherent state path integral. But I'm not going to do much with that unless I get time to go to uh, nonlinear sigma models later. But I, I have a suspicion I won't. Let me just say a couple things about that though. So many bodies, many body spins, unlike sort of bosons and fermions, are usually defined with interacting, um, with interacting interactions between the spins. Okay. Otherwise, you just essentially need a single particle path integral. So all the interesting physics in spin systems is really the many body spin coherent state, because you know just like you're driving on your assignment. It's the interactions between the spins, which typically give you the Hamiltonian, not a term that's just a global magnetic field. That's like the most boring Hamiltonian. By the way, that's not true for things like integer quantum Hall effect and stuff like that. Or, you know, um, lots of these topological terms that I talked about before. These often arise from just sort of single particle path integrals with interesting topology derived for some reason, right, by the symmetries dictated by the system. So you, when you have interactions, you have a much more complicated Hamiltonian term, which can also have berry phases. So you have these two things which makes the, the many body spin coherent state pretty difficult. So the typical example is that Heisenberg model, which you're deriving. Which I've written before. So in the many body spin language, it's often just something like you can have a general interaction. S dot S. And in the spin path integral, well, number one, you have to know how to take the matrix element of that with the coherent states, but you know how to do that. Because S dot S just gives you omega dot omega, like I told you before. And then everything else in the path integral just moves analogously to the single particle case, or the many, many, sorry, the many particle coherent state case that we looked at before. So you take your spin coherent state, and you just write it as a product of single particle coherent states.
So the G, I don't know what you would call it. All you have to do is sort of keep track of these products. This is many body, I don't know. Because then when you form the overlaps and so on, you just have to keep track of those products. So you'll have all these omegas. Oh yeah, and the overlap has S in it, IS. And this I, or sorry, this S is what shows you that the, the overlap vanishes exponentially when S goes to infinity. So that's the equivalent of H bar going to zero. That's classical spins. So if you have an overlap, and then you basically need a resolution of the identity. Which is one. I can't remember, you're deriving one of these, but I forget which one. Or none of them, I forget. Okay, I'm getting bored, so. All of these ingredients, you basically can, you can just go ahead and write this, the path integral. Um, so once you have the many body path integral for the spin case, the trick is solving it. Okay, so unlike what we've dealt with up till now, either many body uh, coherent state path integrals to bosons and fermions, which are non-interacting, so they're Gaussian, so we can take all these Gaussian integrals, get the Green's function, Calculate all these response functions, whatever we want to do. Or the single particle path integral, which we could basically manipulate into something that uh, makes some physical sense. This is, turns it into a pretty hard problem. So there's no sense in me writing down this whole path integral for, say, the Heisenberg model. Because, I mean, like, we could work through it, but it's a very difficult problem. And interactions, just like in the case of, you know, second quantized bosons and fermions. It's the interactions which make things non-Gaussian, essentially, which makes it so you can't uh, solve these things exactly. So just by the nature of spin Hamiltonians, I think the, the path integral gets quite a bit more complicated to solve. So what I want to start with is just sort of a framework for, I guess, perturbative solutions for these types of interacting problems. So let me just set that up now and we'll finish it next time. So there's different ways I could do this. I mean, we could write down specific path integrals and <clears throat> look at the form of the per perturbations and so on, but let's just build a general framework, which is more like a field theory framework. And uh, the interactions give us terms in the action which aren't quadratic and so that's why this is called 5-4 field theory. So what we're doing is we're abstracting more and more. We started with, we started the class with like a, a, an Ising model. It was like a transverse field Ising model. A physical Hamiltonian. We motivated the idea that we have a D plus one dimensional classical stat mech problem. Everything we've been doing are these D plus one dimensional quantum or classical stat mech problems. And with the spin path integral, all we did was show where quantum mechanics comes from, like, you know, revisit the quantum mechanics that gave us the path integral. And we've explored a bit sort of the classical equations of motion. 
So let's abstract further to just a sort of general field theory that's built on symmetries. Okay. Um, so we'll go back to thinking about sort of second quantized Hamiltonians. So this is an interaction term, but let me let me move on from the spins and just think again about sort of raising and lowering operators and bosons and fermions. So I don't know, H. So I have a non-interacting piece. It could be like a kinetic energy, A dagger A, IJ. You can imagine this as a hopping term. It takes a particle on site J and annihilates it and hops it to site I. So it's like a kinetic energy term. And all the interactions in these second quantized Hamiltonians I'll write it like this. Remember, in second quantized form, quite generally, just normal ordered, A dagger, A dagger, A, A, uh, I, J, K, L, I, J, whatever those things are. So pairwise interactions. <clears throat> so in the coherent state path integral, you know exactly where this Hamiltonian term occurs. Two particles, I mean, it's like, it's like moving particles dependent on something that depends on all of them or something like that. Okay, so you can have, so the, sort of all the interactions encoded in whatever this thing is. So you need, all, you, like all the indices occur basically in that thing. So okay. if you had, you, you can imagine having two separate hopping terms, like, you know, particles that move where the indices aren't connected, then it's non-interacting because they don't care about each other. But here they basically have to care about each other. So it's just a general way of writing, like that's all, you know, it's a necessary symmetry of all the operators and something that connects them all together. So here it's just, in the spin language, it's like you have two indices. So this Jij is what connects spin i and j. No matter where they are, they could be distant neighbors, they could be nearest neighbors, something like that. So. <clears throat> okay, actually, Let's just, let's just work on the path integral next time, since I'm always keeping you guys late. So all, all we're doing now is developing an approximation, approximation framework and a strategy for those types of interacting terms. And this will be a sort of a general field theoretical framework that like allows us to 
essentially construct actions based on symmetries and so on. So that's more along the sort of, I guess, maybe true philosophy of, of what field theory looks like, is that you'll have, you'll be motivated by some term um, in, a, in an action, or in a Hamiltonian. And you'll construct an action based on just the symmetries that you see in that Hamiltonian. And from that, from those symmetries, so from, from that action, you can discern most of the behavior of that Hamiltonian, or most of the important sort of behavior. Um, just by, you know, without explicitly solving the model. And so there's some sort of, you know, some sort of course graining involved in the model, or there's some sort of continuum limit involved in the field theory um, that we'll discuss next time. But, but the philosophy uh, is just that you'll get sort of universal behavior from that, from that correspondence. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, say, all these second quantized indices, which I can imagine, say, labeling sites or labeling particles in, this, uh, in the spin case, and taking this separation between my lattice length scales delta you know, towards zero to get a continuum theory. So next time we're going to start throwing away all these labels. I basically want to throw away all these I and J labels. And just talk about fields, which live somewhere in position and momentum space, and construct a path integral from that. Okay, so that's what we'll, we'll do next time. I'll bring you a new assignment on Thursday. And I'm like half done marking assignment one. So Next uh, week's reading week, you guys want to take a break? Yeah? You busy? You got other stuff going on besides this class? <laughs> yeah. I looked at the length of the term, and basically it, that's how it works out. So I think I'm supposed to take a, a reading week. So. so let's do it. Next week we'll, uh, we'll take a break. Um, I'll give you an assignment that's short enough that you can get it to be back in two weeks. Um, but I'll see you guys on Thursday.